thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy and your faithfulness that you've proven again and again. God, we glorify your name this morning. We ask that your spirit would be here, that our attention would be on you. God, we love you. We love you. Amen. share something with you. Um, I'm going to read it right out of my Bible with my 
notes, and uh, I, I'm in a little bit of denial <laughs> that I can't see anymore. <laughs> I'm sure I need glasses, but I'm not going to do it yet, so <laughs> I'm just going to read it for you. Um, uh, first, I just want to thank God. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you indwell us, you give us your power, you guide us. God, I pray that your spirit would be here with each one of us. Lord, that we would see things the way that you see them. God, we need your perspective. I know that we're all, you know, um, going through this life together, this church. We're going through this life together. And um, sometimes our circumstances seem so big. That's what we see with our eyes, right? That's what we see is our circumstance and our situation. And... Um, we need the Holy Spirit to show us um, a, a bigger perspective. When we turn our eyes on God and not on our circumstance or our situation, uh, he's glorified. He's glorified. And, and one of the ways that we can change our perspective is through our praise and through our thanksgiving. You know, the enemy, we have an enemy in case you didn't know, and he doesn't want you to be here. He doesn't want you to gather here with his church, with his people. He wants you to to nurse those hurt feelings maybe you had this week or maybe a, a lie that um, you don't belong here. Maybe, maybe a lie that you're not good enough or that you're not gonna have victory in your marriage or in your finances or with that, with that terrible nagging health issue. Whatever it is, I don't know what's, what's gnawing at you. I don't know what the enemy of your soul is um, jabbing you with. But you have a powerful tool with prayer and song. You know, I, I'm reading in the Old Testament. Right now I just finished Joshua. And when God told the Israelites to go to battle, oftentimes he would say, you're going to be victorious. That's the truth. It's the promise I've given you. And he put the singers right in the front because they were shouting God's praise and the truth of who God is. And so they didn't have time to focus on their enemy. They were already shouting, victory, merciful is our God. So as we sing this next song, I'm just thinking of each of us who is, you know, your battle isn't against the Moabites, <laughs> but your battle is a spiritual battle. In scripture right here, it says that your enemy is not of flesh and blood. It's not your relative who's driving you bonkers. It's not this church that maybe you can find things to be critical about. It's not even you, your, your anxiety or your fear. The enemy, the battle against him is spiritual. And we are engaging in warfare when we come here and we declare his truth. And the victory that we know we have in Jesus, the victory is in declaring Jesus. So that's what I want us to do right now. We're going to sing his praise, and we're going to battle. <laughs> This is 
So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my My name is Chelsea. Welcome to Stony Creek Church, and thanks for being here. In just a little bit, Pastor Randy will be continuing our message series on the Ten Commandments, entitled The Perfect Ten. We are so glad you joined us here at our temporary home at Shelby Junior High. We are here for the next few months as our building just a few miles south is under extreme renovations. There's been a lot of progress in the past few weeks. We've seen the brand new second story start to develop as workers have secured the steel in place. The new stage has been framed in and will soon take shape. Cranes placed new heating and cooling units on the roof, and we expect to start seeing some exterior work very soon. It is important to remember the vision behind these renovations, to build for the future, and to give us space to introduce people to Jesus and his church. In fact, if you're new with us today, we would love to get to know you better. 
We want you to know that church is so much more than a Sunday service or a building. One of the best ways to take your next step is to simply fill out that connection card in your program. In just a bit, we will have our time of offering, but if you are new, please don't feel obligated to give. You can just put that connection card in the offering bag when it comes around. Or better yet, after service, bring it to the Welcome Center in the entryway, and we have a great gift for you with information on the church, a mug, and even some chocolate. Right around the corner, we have Operation Christmas Child, a great opportunity to help out children around the world during Christmas season. Their mission is to provide children with shoeboxes prepared by you with small toys, hygiene products, and even school supplies. For more details, check out the flyer in your program or visit the booth set up by the Welcome Center. Plan now to bring in your shoebox on Sunday, November 11th or 18th. Have you been thinking about getting baptized? Our one-time baptism class will be held on Sunday, November 11th during our 9.30 a.m. teaching time. The class will be held in one of the classrooms here and we'll even be planning to have our baptism right here at Shelby Junior High. We will schedule it on the following Sunday, November 18th during the 11 a.m. service. Sign up at my.stonycreek.church under classes or mark your connection card and put it in the offering when it comes by. What a great day it is today. Thanks for choosing to be a part of Stony as we seek to make more and better followers of Jesus together. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, as we enter this time of worship, um, as we give to you, God, I pray that you would um, receive this uh, gift of offering as, as an overflow of gratitude. Um, we know that everything that we have is just given to us temporarily. And um, this act of worship just says that we trust you. Um, you're in control. God, I pray that you would take this, um, these tithes and offerings and just um, bless them and uh, uh, multiply them and uh, make them useful to advance your kingdom uh, for the fame of Jesus Christ. Uh, I ask this in your name. Amen.
praise to you because you are worthy. You are always worthy. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. see you today. A story is told of a farmer who was angry and frustrated about the melons that were stolen from his melon patch night after night, and so he devised a dishonest way to deal with the thief. He posted this big, ugly, scary sign with a skull and crossbones on it that said, one of these melons is poison. And his strategy seemed to work, at least at first. That night, no melons were stolen. The second night, no melons were stolen. But on the third day, the farmer noticed that his sign had been altered. The word one had been crossed out, and the sign was changed to read, two of these melons are poisoned. His supposedly harmless white lie backfired on him, and he was forced to destroy his entire crop because of it. Today is part 10 in our series, The Perfect 10, and our message today is entitled, Nothing But the Truth. God originally spoke the Ten Commandments to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai as they Listen, some 3,500 years ago. And that was the, the basis of his law for his people. And for us, Jesus' teachings, his life, his, uh, his death, his resurrection, show Christ's followers how God's commandments are to be obeyed by us. We've learned that the Ten Commandments are not just rules to be mindlessly obeyed or followed, they're about a relationship, a personal, dynamic relationship with the one true God through faith in Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, uh, Chris uh, taught the lesson that day, giving instead of stealing. We learned about you shall not steal. Today, we're looking at the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. Now, maybe you're thinking, as I have thought many times, this commandment seems to be talking about giving false testimony in a courtroom, as in making a false accusation, uh, somebody committing a crime that they didn't commit, and I accused them of that. Is that correct? Well, yes, that is correct. Then you might be wondering, does this mean that normal, everyday lying is not necessarily wrong? Maybe a white lie now and then is okay. Maybe it's okay to lie to avoid embarrassment or to avoid losing money or getting into trouble. Maybe it's okay to call in sick when you're not really sick and you just Want to go to the beach with your friends, huh? Maybe uh, a phony excuse when I don't want to show up for a certain invitation is okay. After all, I'm not courtroom. I'm not under oath. I'm not testifying against my neighbor. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just a harmless white lie. I'm not breaking the ninth commandment, right? Actually, these are pretty decent questions, I think. Have you ever asked questions like this? Now, don't lie. I see Nick is a, a truthful man here. Very good. Thank you. It's true that the Ninth Commandment speaks to a courtroom kind of setting. False accusation was a serious crime in ancient Israel under Old Testament law. If I got 
caught falsely accusing you of a crime, uh, and it was known that this is a false accusation, I would be punished for the crime I accused you of committing. That was the law. But if this is what the Ninth Commandment is about, does it leave us any slack outside of the courtroom? Today, we're exploring how the Ninth Commandment applies to us as Christ's followers. Why is it important? It's all boiled down in our main idea. The one thing you want to remember, if you forget everything else I say, and if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, you'll want to write it down. It goes like this. A Christ follower is always on the witness stand. A Christ follower is always on the witness stand. Always, always, always the truth. Even when it's a white lie, even when it will cost me, why does it matter so much? Well, that's what we're going to look at first here. You'll notice on your outline two reasons why true testimony matters so much. It does matter. And I want to show you how it matters, why it matters. The first reason, number one on your outline, is Jesus is all about true testimony. That's his mission. That's his passion. That's his will for your life. How many of you have seen the movie Avatar? Hmm? Any? Yeah, a number of you have seen it. We were just down at Disney World, and we went on that uh, Banshee ride and the Avatar line, I'm telling you, that, that is the neatest ride I think I've ever been on. There's some other really great ones there, but it's the Avatar uh, theme there in that uh, ride. And in that movie, the Avatar movie, it's about a man, a human, who swaps out his body to inhabit the body of a being uh, on a distant planet so he can live among these beings on their planet as one of them. And that, in a way, by way of illustration, is what the Son of God, Jesus Christ, did. He pre-existed his earthly life. His, his existence didn't begin when he was conceived in the virgin's womb or when he was born in Bethlehem. He always existed as God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. But when he visited this planet, he became human and lived among us. Why? So he could die as a mortal man on the cross for our sins, pay for our sins, and be raised immortal, never to die again. But that wasn't the only reason for Jesus coming to planet Earth as one of us. Another reason was to testify to the truth. Look at the words of Jesus in John chapter 18, verse 37, he says, The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Notice that word testify. It's important. This is courtroom lingo. And in John's gospel, Jesus often uses this courtroom terminology as though he has come to earth kind of like to testify in court. Jesus came to earth as a witness. Look what he says in uh, John chapter uh, 8, beginning at verse 17. And help me out when we come to the yellow print. Jesus is speaking. He says, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself, my other witness is the Father who sent me. Now notice that uh, as far as Jesus is concerned, he's always on the witness stand, testifying to the truth, just as God the Father is doing. Look at what the risen Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus says, help me out, these are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness. Notice, he calls himself the Amen. What's Amen mean? So be it. It is true. It's correct. It, that's what it means. Jesus is saying, call me. 
call me amen. I am the truth teller. And notice, too, that he goes on and calls himself the faithful and true witness. He's the embodiment of reality. You see, the ultimate reality, the reality that is not contingent or dependent on anything, is God himself. And Jesus is God in the flesh. And so he is reality embodied. But notice, the, the risen Jesus, when he goes on to say he's the faithful and true witness, there's that courtroom lingo again. And so even after his resurrection, when he's enthroned in heaven, which is the setting in the book of Revelation, Jesus is still on the witness stand testifying to the truth. He's all about the truth. He embodies truth. He breathes truth. This, is, this means you can absolutely trust Jesus' words as, well, literally gospel truth. You know, some editions of the Bible print the words that Jesus speaks in red. It's called a red letter edition. And many Christian Bible scholars don't like that. They object to that, really. They, they say that makes it look as though Jesus' words are truer than the other words of Scripture, or maybe just, you know, we should obey these words and not the others. And I, I understand the concern, but I, I really disagree. The paper Bible that I use is a red letter edition. Why? Not because the words of Jesus are truer. No, every word of God is precious and true. It's all equally true. But there's something extra special about the words the Lord Jesus spoke when he was personally present here on the earth. It's like he reserved those words to say when he comes in person. It's like when the, the, the press secretary comes out and speaks for the president. That's, you know, you could say that's what the president is saying. But he reserves the things that he wants to say personally himself. And that's kind of like what Jesus did. There's something extra special about Jesus' words. The Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the four biographies of Jesus' earthly life are, are the most precious, precious that we have in the Bible. Read and study them repeatedly. Memorize those red letters. If you've never read through the Bible, before. Begin with the Gospels. Absorb Jesus into yourself. Be nourished. Be sustained by Jesus. He is the true and faithful witness. You say, okay, Randy, we got it. Jesus, you can depend on him. He's the truth. But what does this have to do with obeying the ninth commandment? Well, it has everything to do with it as we look at our second reason why true testimony matters so much. Number two on your outline, Jesus places us on his witness stand. You're in a courtroom. You're called up to testify. You raise your right hand, put your other hand on the Bible, and you're asked, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And when you say, I do, you are considered under oath. And if you lie, either deliberately by making a, a, a false statement or just by leaving something out that leads uh, to a false uh, inference, of a false impression, you have lied under oath and you can be charged with perjury. Now, often today, it's kind of assumed or understood that uh, unless you're under oath or you're under legal contract, uh, honesty is not necessarily, absolutely that important. I mean, you know, I, I didn't sign anything. I didn't swear to tell the whole truth. Actually, in Jesus' day, this kind of thinking was quite popular, as well as it is today. To swear to God in Jesus' culture, using the sacred name of Yahweh was the way to say, look, 
I, I must be telling the truth because I'm swearing in God's name. I'm taking an oath in his name. Only swearing by God's holy name was considered truly sinful. Not so according to Jesus, however. Christians are always under oath. Look at how he takes on this mentality in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Look at what Jesus says. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break the oath but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. That would be swearing in the name of uh, Yahweh, the name of God. But then he goes on in verse 34 to say, But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You see, it was thought in those days that if you swore by God's name, you, you had to tell the truth. But if you swore by something lesser than God, like Jerusalem or the temple or something else, then, well, it wasn't quite as sinful. You could maybe sneak in a little lie there. But notice, he says, don't, don't bother with any of that. He says, do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. Help me at verse 37. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In other words, for Jesus' followers, there are not two levels of honesty. There are not two levels of honesty. One, when you're under oath, when you're under, under contract, when you're making it very clear that, yes, this is the truth and I'm going to abide by this contract or I might be uh, penalized for it. And number two, the other level of so-called uh, level of honesty is uh, normal conversation. You know, a little fib here or there, exaggeration, phony flattery. Understandable, especially if it's going to save you embarrassment or money or maybe even your job? I've got to lie, it's part of my job. Yeah, go ahead and say you sold the car for X amount when you really sold it for Y amount. Come on, everybody does it. Not so, not us. Why not? Because Jesus has placed us on his witness stand. He is the faithful and true witness and he is in us, and we are in him. We follow his lead, and we do as he does. Look at what uh, Jesus says here in John 15, 27. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. There's that courtroom lingo again. You must testify. All of life, according to Jesus is the witness stand for a Christ follower. You say, yes, but isn't he talking here about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news? Yes, but when are we witnessing? Hmm? Is it not every day? Is it not 24-7? In the Old Testament, God tells his people, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, declares Yahweh, Isaiah 43.10. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Acts 1.8, the word of a Christian should be as reliable as the sunrise. It should mean something. You should be able to take that word to the bank, as it were. And so let's look at, for the remainder of our time, four perjury traps for the Christ follower the next part on your outline. The first one, number one, is fibs. Fibs. Now what is a fib? Uh, the dictionary will tell you that a fib is a lie, but typically an unimportant lie. That's what it says. I use the word fib here because we all know that it's wrong to lie. But sometimes we can convince ourselves that it's okay to fib. <laughs> right? 
It's a white lie. Oh, it's a white lie. I didn't know they came in different colors. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want a blue one. I want a yellow one. Oh, but a white one. Now, that's the best of all. Nope. Brothers and sisters, for a Christ follower, lies come only in one color. And it's not white. A lie is a lie. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Notice he states it both ways here, doesn't he? Negatively and then positive. Negative, don't speak falsehood, and then positively, speak only truth to your neighbor. And, and you notice here in this translation, I think it's right, he doesn't use the L word. He doesn't even say lie, he just calls it falsehood. And so that would include fibs, would it not? Yes, indeed. A typical so-called fib might be calling in sick when you're really not, or when you say you'll show up for small group, or for your ministry assignment and you're a no-show. Eh, they'll get along without me. Well, you need to try to make that right if you can't show up for some reason. Or on your voicemail message, I can't come to the phone right now when you're standing there screening the call, right? <laughs> or uh, leave a message and I'll call you back. Do you really call the person back? Leave a message and I'll call you right back. I hear that one a lot. I'll call you right back. Oh, boy, but this person doesn't seem to answer, listen to his, uh, his uh, messages very much because I haven't gotten my call back yet. Well, look, if you don't intend to call every person back, don't make a promise to do so. Don't say you're going to call them right back. Just say, uh, leave a message if you like, or something like that. Don't make a promise that you're not going to, you don't intend to keep. You say, oh, come on, Randy, these are just incidental oversights. They're not really lies. Well, folks, what I'm trying to communicate to you to, here today is that as Christ followers, we, we, we answer to a higher standard. We are truth tellers. People should, we, we should have the reputation with, with people. When he says something, he follows through on it. He's dependable. He, she's trustworthy. Let me get to some more alarming fibs Christians commit. For example... How about when you sign up to become a member of Stony Creek Church? Hmm? It's a voluntary commitment. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. It's all up to you. It's voluntary. We make this commitment together. We even sign it. It's a formal commitment. How about when you sign the membership renewal form, those of you who are members, every year, and you, you recommit to maintain your prayer and Bible reading time daily, attend church weekly, unless providentially hindered, of course, and give 10% of your income to Stony Creek Church. Sadly, there are folks that commit to do this year after year and give nothing or far below a poverty wage tithe. Folks, this, this is heartbreaking. And it, it dishonors the Lord. It's really, it's not about us. It's about your relationship with Him. Now, as always, if you're struggling spiritually, financially, whatever, come talk with us. You, you will find compassion. You'll find understanding. You'll find genuine help, sincere help, wise counsel. But don't perjure yourself. Don't perjure yourself. The second perjury trap for the Christ follower, number two on your outline here, is gossip. Gossip. That juicy tidbit of information about so-and-so that may or may not be true. How many of you like listening to gossip? Hmm? No one? Oh, I love it. 
Now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's fun, right? And you know what? The Bible, the Bible says so. Look at it. Proverbs 18, verse 8. The words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down into the inmost parts. He's saying it, it, it tastes good. We like it. Think of your very favorite food to eat. Maybe it's a juicy steak or a to-die-for dessert of some kind. As soon as you see it, you say, oh, you smell it. I've got to have that. Gossip is to your ears what that yummy food is to your eyes, to your nose, to your taste buds. Oh, it's so delicious. And, and we just need to you know, admit that to ourselves. Yeah, I, I like that, but that doesn't mean it's good. It's so easy to gossip or to listen to gossip, isn't it? Especially if it comes in maybe the form of a prayer request or when somebody says, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but uh, it's so hard to just say, well, then please don't. Because that's really what we should say if, if they probably shouldn't tell us this. You know, we need to stop gossip in its tracks. If, if you hear me talking behind somebody's back, kindly tell me to shut up. Really, kindly, in love. If you hear me talking about an unresolved problem with so-and-so, Ask me, Randy, ha have you spoken to so-and-so? Have you addressed this problem with so-and-so? And if I come back and say, well, not yet. I'm praying about talking to him about it. Or no, I'm not talking to him about it. It won't do any good. Then you need to get in my face and say, look, Randy, if you're not going to address this with so-and-so, you shouldn't be addressing it with me. There is one place you can gossip. One place. It's called the gossip safe place. All right? A lot of things about safe places these days. You know where it is? It's on your knees privately before the Lord in prayer. Gossip all you want there. But gossip is not just whispering about people you know. In a day of social media, we need to be careful to vet the tweets and the memes and even the news stories that we pass on on Facebook or share as fact in personal conversations. You know, it's irresponsible to pass on fake news. Just because you hear a news report that favors your political viewpoint doesn't make it true. Too many Christians believe the report, the first report, or only the report that favors their bias. And we all have our biases, folks. We need to be as objective and fair as we can. Now, we can and we should have honest and respectful debate. I think that's very helpful. That's the way we learn. And that can even improve a friendship. But before you, you speak or share or tweet, you need to vet the source, right? Only makes sense. Look at the third perjury trap for the Christ follower. Number three on your outline is flattery. Flattery. The lie wrapped up in a compliment. By flattery, I, I don't mean a sincere compliment or a word of encouragement. That we need more of. Scripture commands us to constantly Build one another up. It's one of the few things Scripture tells us we need to do every day is to encourage each other. Every Christ follower should be a gushing fountain of encouragement with every person we meet, a fountain that never gets shut off. Pile on the encouragement. Constantly scan the horizon. Look for somebody who's doing something good and Encourage them for that good that they're doing. Tell them about it. 
But flattery is something different. And we so easily drift into it, sometimes even when we're trying to encourage someone. That's why I call it a trap. Not only for you, but it's also a trap for the person you're trying to flatter. Look at what Proverbs 29.5 says. Those who flatter their, number, their neighbors are spreading nets for their feet. You're setting a trap for them. How so? Because it can end up hurting that person later. They believe what you say. They want to believe it. I knew a woman who was convinced she could sing. She could sing well because people around her were flattering her about it. And people who, you know, everybody knew that she couldn't. When she hit a note, she damaged it. And you had to call the insurance company. I, it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't pleasant to listen to. But, her, but when she finally discovered that the truth, she was, she was devastated. She was crushed. Before you speak, ask, is it true? Of course, we, we want to encourage our kids. You know, when they're into sports or they're working on an assignment at school, they're trying to do their best, heap on the encouragement, but make sure it's truthful. And maybe you guys are wondering, well, what do you say when the wife asks, do you like this outfit on me? <laughs> and the truth in this particular case is not what she wants to hear? Beats me, I don't know. I, I'm still working on that one, I just tell you. <laughs> Let's move on from that uh, topic to the fourth, <laughs> the fourth perjury trap for the Christ follower is malicious truth-telling. When I was a kid, there was a, a boy on our block, same, same age as me, who was born with a, a disorder that affected his speech, affected his appearance, affected his coordination. And unfortunately, he became the brunt of, of cruel and cutting remarks from his peers, from us kids. And I admit to my shame of participating in that, how I regret that. I wish somehow I could see him again and, and talk to him. But I told myself back then, I'm only joking. And after all, it's true. He does walk like that and sound like that. Oh. Too often, we treat truth like a prostitute by weaponizing it. And that is wrong. That is malicious. Too often Christians use the Bible as a weapon to harm rather than to heal, to puff ourselves up so we can look down on somebody else judgmentally. This is not the faithful and true witness of Jesus. You say, but Randy, aren't Christians supposed to extend tough love as well as tender doesn't the truth hurt sometimes? Don't we need to tell people the truth that they need to hear but don't want to hear even when it may hurt their feelings or cause them to reject us? Answer, yes. But think of it this way. Truth is sharp, like a, a razor-sharp knife or sword. But a Christ follower is to handle the truth like a a skilled surgeon handles a scalpel to help, to heal, not with the intention of harming. We are surgeons. We are not Jack the Ripper. A Christ follower handles the truth with care. Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Yes, sometimes that involves telling people things they consider hateful. That's the way they may look at it. They may even call it hate speech. No matter how well and how lovingly you 
You communicate it, but it must always be done to help, never to harm. And, you know, so much depends on the motivation and attitude in which you share something tough. You must always speak in humility as a sinner saved by grace. For example, let's say, let's say you're not a Christ follower. How do I testify the truth to you? Well, I need to be kind and supportive and helpful to you, showing Christ's love to you, not just with words, but with deeds. But I also need to tell you that without Jesus, you're on a path to eternal destruction. Because I care, and because Jesus died for you, I need to tell you that all people, including you, are sinners on a way to eternal destruction. And unless you turn from your sin and repentance and embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will perish. I need to assure you that God loves you. He doesn't want you to perish. That's why he sent Christ. He came to this planet to testify to the truth and to die in your place on the cross and be raised from the dead. I need to urge you to trust in Jesus and offer to lead you in a prayer to do that. And regardless of your response, whether you hug me and, and thank me for telling you the truth or you spit in my face, I always need to show you God's love as a true friend. Why? Because I'm a Jesus follower. And he has placed me on his witness stand. A Christ follower is always on the witness stand. Have you been honest? Have you been honest with yourself? The heart, we're told in Scripture, is deceitful above all things. We can convince ourselves that we're not lying to others or, or to ourselves. Do you need to get real with yourself? Maybe about an addiction. Maybe about something you've been avoiding for a long time. Get real with yourself and with God. Do you need to confess and come clean today? Jesus said that the truth will set you free. If you want that freedom today, come to Jesus in true repentance and faith. He will welcome you with open arms. And our pastoral prayer team, if you'd like to talk or pray about something, we'll be glad to help you here when the service closes. Let's stand for closing prayer. Lord, I am so grateful that you tell us the truth that amidst all the, the fake news and, and lies and flattery and fibs and all kinds of stuff going on around today, that we can look to your book and know that we have the truth. But Lord, help us to more than just know it, but to believe it and to obey it and to depend on Jesus, to live this commandment in his power, in his strength. And I pray for any person today who's, who's running, running away from the truth because that person thinks facing the truth is a bad thing when really that's what that person needs to do. I pray, Father, for that person. In Jesus' name, amen.